So now there are a few questions, okay? let me answer them before going on to the final topic of our day which is the angular momentum of a particle. Okay, so first uh, question is from sir 1313 and the question is how to calculate Coriolis acceleration component. There is one thing which I want to emphasize is that, that strictly speaking okay, Coriolis acceleration component the way this term is used is used when we are analyzing motion in a rotating frame of reference which we are not doing here. Okay. But still, okay, if we are, if we think about, if we want to think little bit about Coriolis force, okay, these all these analysis that we are currently doing are from an inertial frame point of view, and as far as this particular course is concerned, we are good with that. But if you still want to have some interpretation of the Coriolis force, okay, how does it look like in an inertial frame of reference? Then this component 2r dot theta dot, you can think of this, okay, as the Coriolis force component when interpreted, uh, when interpreted from inertial frame of reference. So, this 2 r dot theta dot is a component which is very typical for radial and transverse components and we can think of this as something which is similar to the Coriolis force. So, the next is with friction on the pulley explain one problem is asked by center 1060. Uh, so, if we have friction on the pulley uh, then those problems uh, they become reasonably involved especially even if the mass is present okay, if the pulley has a mass and it also has friction okay but again now friction is of two types one is the internal axle friction okay which we had discussed okay so let me go on to the whiteboard so the pulley friction can be thought in in this way that this is the pulley okay this is the pulley and this is the uh, this is the the tiny slot in the pulley by which it is attached to a bearing. Okay. So, the pulley is attached to the bearing okay, bearing or the screw whatever you way you want to think about it okay, through which this pulley is attached and now the pulley is free to rotate in this direction. And we have strings T 1 okay, tension T 1 and T 2. Now, note one thing if this pulley mass is neglected. And we say that the that the connection between the pulley and the bearing, okay. So this is the bearing is well lubricated or frictionless okay almost frictionless then in that case even though there may be a friction okay possibility of friction between this rope and the pulley okay so new is present okay that doesn't mean that this new this friction has to act just because there is a coefficient of friction present between this rope and the pulley doesn't mean it will always act if this internal lubrication is very high okay that means this joint is almost frictionless and the mass of the pulley is neglected then in that case T 1 becomes equal to T 2. If the friction is present here then the problem becomes significantly more difficult why because we have to look at what is called as journal friction and I do not think we are going to discuss this problem here okay journal friction and the dynamics of journal friction we are not going to discuss that problem here. But if the everything is frictionless but still the pulley has mass then we will see that T 2 minus T 1 times R can be written as moment of inertia of this pulley okay, about this axis of rotation times the angular acceleration. It can be written like this and some problems can be solved accordingly. So, let me see if I can incorporate a problem of this type okay, in uh, tomorrow's tutorial. Okay. Let me see if I can do that. But note that if friction is present here, it is an incredibly difficult problem. Okay. Let us not worry about that for the time being. Okay. But if you have mass then this will how the equation will be modified. 
But in the problem which we had solved earlier, we had neglected the mass of the pulley and we had also said that all the joints are frictionless. So, automatically this I alpha, okay, because uh, moment of inertia it depends on mass for a cylinder uh, for uh, uh, for a cylindrical disc it will look like mr square by 2 since mass is neglected this approximately becomes 0 and then t1 become equal to t2 is what we had discussed before fine the third question is how we can use constraint relation for this problem the question is asked by 1 2 1 5 uh, it is not clear to me that what is this constraint relation that what problem we are talking about can we visit that center 1 2 1 5 yes sir sir the wedge and the block problem ha 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 sir uh, ca can we use the constraint relation the acceleration in x direction of wedge and x direction acceleration of block and y direction of acceleration of block with a constraint relation as we did in the pulley problem okay so let we me take get the reference point and distance yes sir yes okay let me let me answer that question okay so let me go to the the corresponding slide let me go to the block problem look here in the block problem one thing which is very clear okay that this look at each of the blocks individually okay do not look at them like as a part of this complete system think of this block a independently now we know for sure that block a the constraint on the block a is that that it cannot have any acceleration in the vertical direction why because it cannot penetrate this it cannot lose contact so this acceleration is zero so but it can have a free acceleration in the x direction so that one acceleration that this block can have now look at block b now this block b okay if you look at it independently okay then what can it do it can have two particular acceler it can have two directions of motion okay one okay it can have a motion in the vertical in in a normal direction it can have a motion okay independently if this block were not present or it can have a motion in the tangential direction but note one thing that because of the presence of this block what we have realized now that the presence of the block is constraining the motion for this one in the in the normal direction so that constraint we are already using that we are using the constraint that this block a cannot penetrate so it has only acceleration in this direction similarly for block b there are two possible direction one is along the block along the uh, incline one is perpendicular to the incline but what we realize is that that it cannot penetrate in neither can it lose contact so this acceleration is still gone okay so the only free acceleration it has is in this direction but also note that because these two are connected with each other if the block move a moves in the horizontal direction that additional okay because the contact should not be lost between a and b so that additional acceleration also comes on to it but only thing that happens is that that there are two independent degrees of freedom is this motion and this motion as opposed to in the pulley problem where we are we can reduce the two degrees of freedom to one degree of freedom problem here also we have used the constraint that is block b cannot penetrate this cannot penetrate but after using up all the constraints the four motions that d can these can have one two three four okay two for this two for this those four now they became two after using the constraint so we have used constraints but only thing is that this system is more complicated than the other system and the four degrees of freedom that it can possibly have independently are because of the connections between them reduced to two degrees of freedom is that point clear yes sir okay sir there is another question sir uh, uh, e theta and e t sir the radial direction in the radial direction and the tangential direction are similar to tangential and radial which we are taken in the radial uh, components okay so uh, let me clarify this point okay this point is a very important point okay only okay only when the motion is purely circular okay let us look at this a perfect circle the trajectory of a particle is perfectly happening along a circle only in that case note that er direction is this because i choose the origin as my because note that for tangential and normal acceleration you don't need to choose an origin okay it just depends on the tangent to the path and normal to the path whereas for radial and transverse coordinate er and e theta we need to choose a origin so let us choose our origin as the center of the circle now this will be my er and my transverse direction will be e theta but now if i want to go into tangential and normal coordinates what you realize that the tangent to this this is also equal to et okay and also note that if this is et then this becomes en 
the normal direction. So En is opposite to Er. But this is true only when you choose the origin at the center for a motion along a circle. If you have any arbitrary motion like this, okay, and I choose the origin here, this will no longer be true. So these are completely independent things. But in this special case where the motion is along a circle, this is definitely true. Okay, that Er is equal to minus En and E theta is equal to Et. Okay. Sir, in means matlab, uh, for ER, uh, we have to uh, 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 join that point to the origin. Yes, and yes. Along yes, that line. Yes, is yes. That ER is very component. important. Yes. And perpendicular to this. Yes. So, in radial and coordinates. Perpendicular for to this E theta. Yes, yes, yes. So, you need to have an origin. Okay. You need to have an origin when we want to define, say, for this curve. This will be my ER. Okay. And this perpendicular to the direction will be E theta. Okay, because this is my origin. Any other, other curve? Any curve other than circle? Any other curve which is not pure circular, huh. other than circle curve, so all the four components will be correct. What four components? Four, four accelerations, ER, ET, ET, ET. No, no, so those are all different, they are not identical. See, I am not saying that all the accelerations are independent, but you can no longer say that the radial acceleration is the same uh, as minus of no, normal acceleration and the transverse acceleration or the transverse acceleration is same as the tangential acceleration. You cannot say that anymore. The acceleration is only acceleration. It is only a bar. You can write this as a n e n plus a t e t. You can also write this as a r e r plus a theta e theta. But now a r and a n they are not equal if that you are not moving along a circle. Okay, so this equality is gone now because why? These directions are now completely different. The tangential direction will look like this. The normal direction will look like this. Okay, so this will be ET and this will be EN. So the acceleration is the same, but only when you break it into components, those components will not have any easy relation with respect to each other now. Okay? Okay, but because acceleration is acceleration, you cannot say it has four components. Okay, so uh, next question is by 1060. Uh, uh, how to differentiate kinetics problems, kinematics problem? Okay, the definition is very clear. Okay, kinematics only motion, position, velocity, and acceleration is kinematics. What is kinetics? That given that certain force is acting on the particle, or given that a particle has a particular kinematics, what is kinematics? It has some acceleration and so on. What are the forces, or given those forces, what are the acceleration? So the moment we refer to forces, then immediately we are doing kinetics. When there is no reference to any forces, we are doing kinematics. So kinematics has no reference to the forces, where kinetics always has reference to the forces. So let me put it this way, that we can trace the trajectory of a particle and do the kinematics of the particle. Okay? But we cannot know what are the kinetics of the particle until and unless we invoke the Newton's law and say that F is equal to M times A, and A is the quantity which is the kinematic quantity, and m times a okay is the kinetic law okay which relates the kinematics with the forces in the system okay i hope that is clear so what are dependent and independent motions the dependent and the independent motions uh, so i believe that this is the kind of thing we are talking about for example in this case the motion of a and b are dependent on each other why because of the constraint connecting them in this problem motion of B, okay, independently, if A and B were completely free, then in, in a plane, the degrees of freedom that B has is motion in the y direction, motion in the uh, x direction. Okay. If you choose x is this, y, uh, uh, x is this and y is this, it has two possible motions. A has two possible motions, y, vertical, horizontal. But because they are linked with each other, okay, those motions, for example, or because this A is constrained to move on this block, we know that there is no motion of this A in the vertical direction. Similarly, because B is constrained to move only along this block and along with the block, B cannot have an independent motion relative to A which is going in this direction. Again, relative to A which is perpendicular to the, uh, which is perpendicular to the direction of the plane. So these are simple examples of dependent and independent motion. If this A and B were completely separated from each other and if there were no, uh, and there were no constraint provided, then you would say that motion of B, A are completely independent. But because B cannot lose contact with A, there is some component of B 
okay, that we cannot have that B cannot have any relative acceleration with respect to A in this normal direction. Okay. Let me put it this way. The only relative acceleration it can have with respect to A is along this way, but it cannot have a direct uh, a relative acceleration in, in the perpendicular direction. So, that is I can say is a ex are an example of constrained motion and if this were completely free then that will be an example of completely unconstrained motion. Okay. So, I hope this point is clear. The question is 1131 can the tension in the string connecting bob have a maximum value. The maximum value okay, will all depend on what is the velocity at that particular time. Okay. What is the particular velocity because if you look at this pendulum problem. Okay. Let us look at this pendulum problem here. Okay. Let us look at this problem. Suppose at this point suppose we are not given the tension. Okay. We know that there is some velocity for the bob here and there is a weight of the bob. So, if you look at this diagram okay, this figure what we realize is that that the only forces that act on the bob is the weight which is the main force and the second is the tangent force which is a reactive force because it is a reaction to the motion. And what we immediately see here is that that this acceleration okay, the tangential acceleration in this direction is governed purely by mg sin 30 okay, is governed purely by this component that is the tangential acceleration. Whereas, this acceleration okay, which is equal to v square by r is nothing but T minus mg cos 30. So, clearly the tension depends on the weight of the blob it depends on the weight of the bob and it also depends on what is the velocity of the bob it also depends on the length of the bob. Okay. Why? Because the acceleration correspondingly okay, is given by v square by rho okay, that this two point uh, this tension minus mg cos 30 is equal to m times v square by rho. So, the final tension in the bob it depends on the on the weight it depends on the velocity and it depends on the radius. So, or these three components will decide what is the tension in this bob and depending on what those values are will decide what is the maximum tension that uh, uh, that the string can have when it is connected to this bob which is moving okay, with that particular velocity. Okay. I hope this point is clear that it depends on mass, it depends on velocity, it depends on the length which is the radius of this path. There is a question by center 1060 is centripetal force and tension in rho the same or the different in pendulum problem. Okay. So, this is a very valid question okay. it is a very valid question and let me put it this way. The centripetal force what is centripetal force m times a n this quantity is the effective centripetal force that acts on the bob if you want to use the terminology. And that centripetal force comes from a combination of tension and what minus mg cos 30. So, the total centripetal force acting on this will be this tension minus mg cos 30 and that better have a direction acting inwards okay, otherwise the block cannot sustain that acceleration. Means for example, if the string breaks think about it if the string suddenly breaks okay, I cut it then what happens is that the only force acting on this bob along this direction okay, is mg cos 30 acting outwards. But what is uh, the acceleration the corresponding acceleration is v square by rho but it is acting inwards and because there is no tension to take care of this okay, this, uh, this mass cannot sustain the bob cannot sustain the motion along the direction of the circle it will fly off. It will fly off in the direction of the velocity that it currently has. Think about it if you were rotating like this okay, in a vertical plane cut it suddenly then at that instant whatever velocity it, it has okay, it will just fly in that direction. It cannot go along that same curved path why because there is no tension okay, to provide it the required centripetal force. So, the centripetal force is only m times a n and this m times a n is the required centripetal force to keep this bob moving along this path with a given velocity v at any instant. And T minus whatever the weight. So, weight is trying to pull it away, tension is try, trying to give it the centripetal acceleration and the difference of them is the resultant centripetal force. So, the centripetal force has component coming both from T and from the radial component uh, uh, or mg cos 30 component of this weight or the normal component of this weight. So, centripetal force is just m times a n and it comes from these various factors tension and the weight and so on and so long as the effective force coming from these the total centripetal force okay, which is the effective force by all these forces along this direction can equal m a n 
okay you are good okay the 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 bob will keep maintaining that trajectory okay so we cannot say that tension is a centripetal force or tension is different than centripetal force tension is a part of the centripetal force okay i hope this is clear last one how to identify the direction of coriolis acceleration so let me note this thing again that coriolis acceleration okay is actually a 3d phenomena if you you want to go to the complete okay non inertial rotating frames in three dimensions to get a full understanding of that but i mentioned that in passing is that if you want to have some interpretation of the coriolis force because coriolis force is a non inertial force in in the strictest technical terms it will come into picture only where when we are working in non inertial rotating frames of references but all the problems that we are mentioning here all the kinematics is done in uh, in uh, uh, in the inertial frames of references but if you want to have some some intuition okay that in a non inertial frame of reference what will the coriolis force look like then this quantity 2r dot theta dot okay if i look here that this component 2r dot theta dot and the direction is what the direction is this e theta direction is when you say you can think of that as a coriolis force but strictly speaking this is not a coriolis force okay to really get an understanding of coriolis force we have to go to rotating frames of references and from that okay you will find out that what are the accelerations the non inertial accelerations and coriolis force will be one component of that but if you are moving in a circle for example if the motion is motion along a circle okay where there is for example uh, typically like you have uh, like the merry go round problem that we have a merry go round okay and some particle is trying to move on that merry go round or we are trying to walk on that merry go round and we are ourselves stationed on the merry go round at the center okay and our frame now is the non inertial frame of uh, of the rotational frame of the merry go round then in that non inertial frame okay you can think of this 2r dot theta dot as a coriolis force term but it's not a good idea to interpret that as a coriolis force term i just mentioned it briefly so that you can have some correlation with this word that you had heard but strictly speaking this you cannot directly interpret that as a coriolis force it's a non inertial force okay it comes when you are working in non inertial rotating frames of reference center 1103 will there be any centripetal acceleration in the direction of radius okay so i think the centripetal acceleration the discussion that we had a few moments ago i think that will suffice okay so with this much discussion we come now to the the end topic so we will uh, for the next uh, few minutes let us discuss about what we mean by uh, angular momentum and how do we define angular momentum for one particle and how do we define angular momentum for a system of particles okay so this is an extremely interesting topic okay and it will become more clear when we uh, take care of uh, rigid body kinetics and rigid body kinematics tomorrow now how do we define angular momentum of a particle now this is a definition okay so you may ask that why do we define it like this so there is a reason okay one simple reason is that that we define angular momentum like this and whatever definitions we had defined about moments everything okay in for static scores similarly lot of empirical observations that we do real experiments and do measurements and whatever measurements we do and whatever uh, we see uh, uh, whatever this equation tells us they do a very good match and as a result okay we define this quantity which is angular momentum of a particle okay this angular momentum concept is a concept uh, when we define it okay we will see that we can understand a lot of things which we observe empirically and things fall consistently into place okay so let us define now what is angular momentum of a particle to do that okay let us define it in full 3d we have a coordinate frame x y z let us fix our origin at o now a particle p has a position vector of r and let us say it has a momentum mv in this direction the moment of a momentum okay or the angular momentum okay so there are two different terminologies that is used it is moment of a momentum why moment so moment of a force is what r cross v so moment of a momentum what is momentum mv so moment of a momentum is nothing but r cross mv or it is the angular momentum of the particle about o it is just defined as r cross mv or r cross l so this is momentum which is represented as l so the angular momentum of this particle about o is r bar cross l now what is the direction of h0 because this is a cross product r bar and mv or the momentum okay are two vectors and two vectors can always define a plane so unless and until they are parallel to each other two vectors will always define a plane 
and what is this quantity if you recall our cross products then this quantity is perpendicular to the plane containing r and mv and we can use the cross product definition and can easily find out what this quantity is now what we can also do is this okay we can also uh, say okay that this angle which mv makes with this r let us say that this angle is phi okay so then this quantity v sin phi okay what is this quantity v sin phi v sin phi is nothing but a quantity which is perpendicular velocity to this okay which, which is the component of momentum which is perpendicular to r and that can be written as m r square theta dot because this v theta okay let me let me discuss this concept for a second on the white board okay okay if you recall let us look at the planar motion this is r bar okay this is m v bar let us look at only a planar motion for the time being this is x this is y this is theta now what do we have this is e r and this is e theta okay so what is the angular momentum for this particle here p about point o so h o will be nothing but r bar cross m v bar but note one thing that r bar cross m v bar what will that component will be okay that component will be just some magnitude multiplied by k hat which is a unit vector in the z direction coming out of plane okay out of plane now what can we also do for this if you want to find out what is the magnitude of this if this angle is phi what is this this can be written as r m v is the speed multiplied by sin phi but what is v sin phi if you look at this er and e theta so if you look at this er and e theta this is v bar m v bar this is phi so m v bar sin phi is nothing but a component of velocity in the theta direction and if you recall our radial coordinates velocity v theta can be written as in radial coordinates as r theta dot so and as a result we can say that the angular momentum is given by r into m r theta dot which can be written as m r square theta dot okay so this can be easily written in 2d you can write this as m r square theta dot now coming to this let us find out what is the derivative okay so this is just one additional derivation just remember that now let us look at this full derivative uh, full expression that h bar okay that h bar o is equal to r cross mv bar now what if we take the derivative of this angular momentum with respect to time let us take the derivative what do we get we will get r dot cross mv bar that is the first derivative plus r bar cross m times v bar dot but what is r dot r dot is nothing but the velocity and what is v cross v when two are parallel to each other sign of angle between the angle between them is zero so the cross product also becomes zero so this terms become zero or h bar dot can be written as r cross m times a or it can be written as r cross f why because from newton's law we know that for a given particle m times a is nothing but the forces so h bar dot okay or the rate of change of angular momentum of a particle is nothing but the sum of all the moments okay because r cross f is what there are moments acting on the particle so r cross f is sum of all the moments acting on the particle 
and that is nothing but h bar 0. Okay. So, this is as simple as that what we know is that that when we have one particle then the rate of change of angular momentum of that particle about a fixed point this point a should be fixed is nothing but sum of all the moments about this point. Okay. Now, let us take a special case okay. let us take a special case when only force acting on the particle is directed or away from point okay. that let us say that this point P is here this point O is here. Now, what happens is that if the only force that acts on the particle is directed in this direction away from this direction then what happens the body is in this case said to move under what is called as a central force. For example, the two planets okay, when they move under the influence of their gravity the force acting between them is only the gravitational force between them and that is one example of what is called as a central force. Okay. Now, since the line of action of the central force passes through O what we can say is that that sum of all the moments of those forces is equal to h bar dot and it has to be 0 why because those moments pass through the origin and they cannot uh, uh, and they cannot have any moment on this force about point O. So, in that case we, we, we realize that when all the forces acting on the particle pass through the origin then the rate of change of angular momentum is 0. Now, what does that mean? that d h by d t of h bar 0 is equal to 0 it means that the angular momentum of this particle remains constant and we will solve a few problems tomorrow about what this thing means. Now, if you are doing a planar motion for example, as we had discussed just a few moments ago if you are looking at a planar motion then in that case what happens the magnitude of the angular momentum is simply r this is the r this is m v is the velocity into sin phi and if all the forces acting on this particle are moving only in the direction okay, uh, are acting only in the direction which pass through this point about which we have taken the angular momentum then we can say that the angular momentum now is conserved okay, that d h by d t is equal to 0. So, h bar remains constant and as a result r m v sin phi is my angular momentum of the particle along this trajectory about point O and this quantity will hence remain constant. So, for example, if we know what is the angle what is the radius then we can find out how does the velocity move. So, if we can keep finding out that what does theta and phi how does it change as a function of time then if the only force acting on this p acts in a direction such that it cuts to O okay, that it passes through O only force acts is only in this direction then knowing the position of the particle and knowing the trajectory okay, then we can immediately find out how does the velocity of the particle vary as a function of uh, uh, as a function along the trajectory. So, this in simple words is conservation of angular momentum. So, there are a few questions. So, let me take those questions and then I will discuss briefly about angular momentum of a system of particles. Okay, so, first question is by center 1313 is asked how to calculate a gyroscopic couple for a car. Okay, so, first of all let me uh, uh, briefly mention that uh, this gyroscopic motion we are not going to cover in this syllabus it is given in great details in for example, in Beer and Johnston 10, but what I will briefly mention is this okay. I will not go into the details of that okay, because gyroscope okay, it is a it is not a straightforward topic you have to think a lot about it it is a three dimensional rotational motion I have not even gone into the rotational motion portion at all, but let me just briefly discuss what is the gyroscopic motion. The gyroscopic motion is as follows. Okay. But again I am emphasizing this that I am not going to go into the details of that okay. you need to do appropriate amount of mathematics okay. lot of visualization that is not a part and parcel of this course okay. in most engineering syllabuses okay. this not discussed okay. so I am not going to discuss this, but briefly let me mention what is the gyroscopic moment. So, let us say okay, you have a wheel okay, which is rotating like this. Okay. Let us say you have a flywheel okay, forget about rolling on forget about even rolling on the ground. Let us say that there is an axis like this and this wheel has a constant rotation omega about this axis. Okay. Now, this axis is x, this is y and z comes out of the plane. Now, if I look at this wheel from the side how does it look like? This is z, this is y. Okay, z y this is the angular acceleration and this is the vectorial representation 
okay this is the vectorial representation of omega again this is a highly specialized topic i am not going to go into details of that but just let me briefly mention since you have asked okay let me just briefly mention that so that's how it will look like now typically the gyroscopic moment is what the gyroscopic moment is as follows now you take this wheel okay and you try to rotate it okay your wheel is rotating like this okay now you tend to rotate it about the y axis you tend to apply a rotation about the y axis here an additional rotation for example in a gyroscope what happens is that you have also an another axis okay not only this so there are these three, three different axis over which the rotation can happen so if you also try to apply a rotation along the y axis okay this is the spinning wheel you try to apply rotation like this then what happens what happens is that that this was the direction of the angular momentum okay because omega i omega you can think of that as angular momentum we'll discuss that briefly tomorrow that direction of angular momentum tends to change because when you are trying to rotate it like this you tend to change that direction and when you tend to change that direction then what happens the rate of change of angular momentum is the applied torque and you will see that the rate of change of angular momentum happens in this way and there is a torque that happens in the third direction that you try to rotate it like this you will see that the torque acts on it in the third direction and that torque is typically called as the gyroscopic torque it is nothing but if you look from the uh, top okay now if you look from the y direction then what happens is that if i look now this is y this is z if i look from the top direction how does it look like uh, z x what was the initial direction of angular momentum like this but if you rotate if you rotate this wheel then the direction of angular momentum becomes like this even though omega remains constant and this is a change in the direction okay what is this direction change in the direction what does it do okay this change in the direction will create a torque like this why because vectorially this is l1 bar this is l1 bar prime and this is delta l bar what is the orientation of this delta l bar the delta l bar has orientation around the x axis and what is this torque this torque acts like this okay so this is a much detailed question so wheel rotating like this you tend to rotate like this it is very counterintuitive you will see that you will try to topple in this direction and that effect is called as a gyroscopic effect okay so let us uh, like i will only discuss this today let us not discuss about this question okay tomorrow because this is completely outside the purview of this course but because the question was asked i briefly explained that what is a gyroscopic moment one rotation is already happening you try to change the direction of that you will get a torque in the third direction that is one simplest example of what is a gyroscopic torque and like when a car is rotating for example a wheel is rotating like this when you tend to turn okay a similar effect is happening that the wheel of the car is rotating like this okay when you try to steer the car what you are changing is that you are changing the angular momentum of the direction of the car wheel and so the wheel will have a gyroscopic couple or a gyroscopic moment that acts on it okay so i i hope that this is good enough but i will not go into any more details of this problem so the next question is can you please repeat the concept quiz okay sure okay just give me one minute let me go through the other questions also this is simple because uh, that quiz okay i have to go explain that in some more details there is a third very simple question is asked by center 1165 for a block kept on a rough horizontal plane how do we apply a constant velocity the way you apply a constant velocity okay is such because on a rough surface when the block is moving the force acting on the block is what okay the force acting on the block is this mu k times the normal reaction so this is the weight if i draw the free body diagram this is the normal reaction mu k times normal reaction this is the direction of velocity and to keep this block okay moving at a constant speed now what does constant speed means that no acceleration if that is the case then you should then you should apply a force p which is equal to mu k n then the block will keep moving at the constant speed okay that's all it means okay for a rough surface how do we achieve constant velocity what is the difference between centripetal and centrifugal force i had discussed that yesterday the question is asked by center 1071 the question is very straightforward centrifugal force is almost a misnomer centrifugal force is used okay when you go to a non inertial frame of reference 
where you see that apparently there is no acceleration because if I am rotating, okay, if I am in a rotating frame of reference, I will see that everything around me is stationary. But still, I can measure the force. For example, if I am holding onto a block, okay, and I am moving, okay, then I will see that there is a tug that is coming onto the string. But I apparently see no acceleration. Then how do we explain that? We say, oh, in that non-inertial frame of reference, there is a non-inertial frame which is called as centrifugal force that is acting outwards. Okay, so centrifugal force, let us forget about it. It comes only when you discuss non-inertial frames of references from an inertial frame point of view, okay, centripetal force is the appropriate thing to use. Okay, so let us stick to inertial frames and we use centripetal force for, for, a, uh, for a, uh, a point moving in a circular direction or moving along a curved direction. Center 0, 1, 0, 4, 7. Okay, they are asking what is holonomic and non-holonomic constraints. Okay, first of all, okay, so this is a highly, highly sophisticated, uh, uh, advanced question. Typically, these kind of questions come in what is called as uh, um, uh, classical mechanics in physics. Okay, but since I know the answer to this question, let me show off by telling you what is holonomic and non-holonomic constraint. But again, the gyroscopic couple, holonomic, non-holonomic, uh, don't form the uh, the portion or the syllabus for this course. What is holonomic constraint? Okay, this is typical. This is clearly show off okay that there is nothing else because this is not relevant for this course whatsoever holonomic constraint is what let suppose we have a block which is constrained to move in this direction okay then what do we say we say that the position of this block okay this is x uh, i can say that it has a position xa it has a position xb this is one example of holonomic constraints. Look here. Here what we saw is that the y b or the y coordinate of b is equal to half x a. Why? From the inextensibility of the rope. So this particular concept which is explicitly mentioned okay, in terms of position coordinates okay, is one simple example of what are called as holonomic constraints. Now what is non-holonomic will become clear if I tell you that suppose we have two spheres like this. This is A, this is B. This is omega A is the angular velocity of this. This is omega B. These two gears are rotating about their respective centers. Now, if we are given that there is no slippage at this contact point, then what do we know? That the relative velocity here should be 0. And what will you say? That A theta dot A will be equal to B theta dot B. Or if I think in terms of infinitesimal, then for any tiny rotation, A delta theta A is equal to B delta theta B. So the constraints are given in terms of infinitesimal motions and not direct coordinates. Okay? So those are typical examples or what are called as non-holonomic constraints. Okay? But these kind of concepts, okay, I kindly request that we will stick only to the syllabus. Okay? These are highly, uh, they are not highly advanced, but for example, when you go to variational calculus or when you go to classical dynamics, then these are the concepts that we discuss there. And these becomes very important, for example, when we discuss what are called as Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian approach. We write what is called as a Lagrangian approach using generalized degrees of freedom. And there is what is called as Lagrange's equation of motion, which is very similar to Newton's law, but is completely generalized. And in such equations of motion, we have to input these constraints, okay, so as to solve the problems appropriately. So one question, uh, 13, uh, say again question by a center 1302. In the problem 12.6, it is mentioned that the weight of the sleeve acts in the z direction. Can you justify that with the help of a diagram? Okay, it's not a justification, it is a statement of fact. Okay, but I can only illustrate it more care carefully. Okay, in this problem, what we are told is that, that this is a horizontal plane. Okay, so if I draw a simple diagram for this, how will it look? Okay, so this is the r theta plane or x y plane. x y plane, this is the sleeve. And z axis, how it acts like this, okay, outwards. Now, if I look it from the point of view from the x z plane, okay, let us look from the x z plane, how does it look like? This is x and this is z, and this is how the sleeve projection will look like, 
okay so Luca projection projection will look like this and gravity acts in the downward direction so the only thing that the gravity does is for example that is mass think about it this mass can slide only horizontally it can have only planar motion because of the constraints and as a result the acceleration of this mass in the z direction is equal to zero straight away and the only thing that the gravity does if you draw the free body diagram is that that this is the weight which the gravity exerts on the mass and the sleeve which was and the, and the rod to which the sleeve was attached that will provide a normal reaction to balance this weight as simple as that so for the dynamics is concerned this is not doing anything interesting and so we neglected it but on the other hand if this were not like this and gravity acted like this then clearly that will be a part of the free body diagram and it will contribute to the radial motion and also to the theta motion of this entire object there is a question 1203 how to convert dynamic equilibrium to static also explain the d'alembert's principle so d'alembert's principle uh, professor shobik banerji will discuss on uh, on fifth it is nothing okay see d'alembert's principle what is the origin of d'alembert's principle origin of d'alembert's principle is that like in the past people were more accustomed to doing force equilibrium moment equilibrium okay when all the dynamic laws okay were not appropriately fleshed out okay and as a result it was a it was some thinking that okay we are very comfortable thinking in terms of force balance moment balance but we are not very comfortable thinking in terms of acceleration that forces result in acceleration so what do we do we just say that uh, the acceleration can be thought of to be m times a is minus m times a is something like a force acting on the body and let us do that but that is not the best way to do problems sometimes it may simplify it but typically if you can write down equations of the form that force is equal to ma and uh, uh, the torque okay is equal to uh, rate of change of angular uh, 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 rate of change of angular momentum then the problems become much much more simpler okay so d'alembert's principle is essentially just that, that it is just that in the historically there has been some thinking that it is very easy for us to think of equilibrium so let us convert the inertial forces also as some actual forces and that essentially is the d'alembert's principle not a big deal about it but if you want to be very consistent with our approach then d'alembert's principle need not be the best way of doing it but of course it can be helpful for quick thinking explain what is path coordinate okay the path coordinate okay let me briefly discuss about that okay path coordinate why do we need okay or why is it useful let us say the particle has a trajectory like this that a particle is moving along this and by definition if the particle is moving along the trajectory then this arrow that we i am drawing is essentially the instantaneous direction of velocity which is the tangent to this curve now why do we need path coordinate and what do we mean by path coordinate so if we had seen previously that if you use radial coordinates or radial coordinates then i need to fix an origin then i have to define position vector then i have to define that for that trajectory how does the position vector change and so on but for many problems for example when we want to find out what is the acceleration instantaneously of a car at a given point of its trajectory or what is the acceleration of a, uh, of a plane okay in its given trajectory we don't really need to always want to refer to some origin and then discuss what is the acceleration and velocity and in that case this path coordinates come very handy because we immediately realize that velocity vector is nothing but the speed into e tangent what is e tangent e tangent is nothing but the tangent unit tangent vector to this curve okay that is et and then what do we do immediately we know that my speed and the direction is tangent and then dv by dt is then immediately can be written as d speed okay et plus you can do some manipulations look up bj10 or bj a, 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 or any standard textbook okay in also it's given very nicely in bj10 what you will see is that that this will become v derivative of et with respect to t now why does et change because here the tangent is like this if i move a little bit further the tangent will change direction so et will not remain constant okay tangent keeps changing so et unlike your i and j your et came, keeps changing with respect to time and this quantity can be shown to be equal to v into v by rho where rho is the corresponding curvature that we had discussed here that if you try to fit a circle here then the corresponding radius of that circle is the curvature or the radius of curvature and then this becomes v square by rho into en what is en en is the normal in that direction 
okay so that is how we can mathematically we can show but what is a good thing about this that in the path coordinate we immediately understand that acceleration has two components one is the rate at which the speed changes but second is the rate okay it is also comes because the direction of our path changes and that is essentially the centripetal force that acts on the particle at, at that given instant so it is very transparent okay and it has no reference to any coordinate frame or origin so that's why it is attractive and depending on what problem we are doing okay this can be very helpful okay what is the difference okay is the question asked by center 1073 that what is the difference between moment and momentum okay now this is one of the common misnomers we student have moment okay let me again okay discuss this okay this is a very simple thing but students many a times are confused by this in fact even our students they use this word moment and momentum interchangeably and and nothing can be farther from the truth what is moment moment is nothing but a short form for this is force this is r so r cross f is called as moment of a force and as a short form we say just a moment okay no pun intended okay so moment of a force and as a shortcut we just use this word moment whereas momentum as we had just seen is a particle okay it's a kinematic it's a dynamic quantity but a particle has velocity v bar it has mass m then this quantity l bar which is m times v bar this is called as momentum okay so they are only similar sounding words but conceptually they are quite different from each other so moment is nothing but short form for moment of a force and this is momentum so 1182 uh, is there are two normal reactions for weights in problem number 12.3 weight of block is also acting on a wedge okay please elaborate let us go to that problem 12.3 okay so weight of the block also acts on the wedge so this is one clarification which I want to make this is a concept in free body diagram that this block A is lying on block B so we say that the weight is acting on the block but note one thing that the weight is acting on the block but the effect is felt only by the normal reaction that this block is present on this can only be seen when this normal reaction can be exerted means think about it in simple way if I create a hole in this block such that this block A can no longer like step on that block but can collapse inside then in that case even though the weight of the block A uh, weight of the block B is still trying to act on block A because it has no support there will be no that weight cannot be exerted on that block so what can be seen here is that that there is this normal reaction and this normal reaction okay it acts from this block to this of course so the weight is also present but the weight only makes itself felt on the bottom block through this normal reaction and that normal reaction is very clearly mentioned in this free body diagram so the weight does not directly come and act on this but the weight come and acts via the normal reaction and then this block okay why that normal reaction is required because to prevent the acceleration of this block in the vertical direction why because the block cannot penetrate this something needs to balance that weight because otherwise that weight will keep accelerating the block along the direction of the weight because that force is acting there force is equal to ma so acceleration will keep acting in that direction and that acceleration is prevented how by the presence of this normal reaction so you see there is an intricate connection between the forces and the degrees of freedom that if there were no if there were no proper connection okay that there will be a, there may be the, if there were a hole between this and a connection between this then there is nothing to prevent that acceleration and so no normal reaction is required but on the other hand to prevent that kinematic motion in the direction perpendicular to plane a you need to have a normal reaction which is exerted here okay and the weight of the block makes itself felt to block b okay only by this normal reaction okay so it's fine so there is uh, so there have been a, a bunch of questions about what is centrifugal force what is coriolis force i explained that those are the forces that come in non inertial frames of references non inertial rotating frames of references but there is just one last thing okay i just thought that i should mention that how can we think about those forces 
Now let us think about it that there is a rotating table okay and at the center of the table okay exactly at the center of the table assume that you are standing okay you are standing upwards like this at the center of the table and this table is rotating in this direction clockwise direction. Now suppose I keep a coin here somewhere here and let us for simply uh, simplicity assume that the friction between the coin and this table is negligible. Now what is happening is that to begin with I move along with the coin okay if this for example if the coin were glued to the table perfectly glued to the table what would I see I would see that if you are perfectly glued then uh, the coin moves with me. So from my point of view this is me this is coin. So from my point of view I will see that the coin is at rest because after some time the coin will go here okay then next some time the coin will go here but I these are my hands outstretched okay I will also keep rotating. So as far as I am concerned okay if I do not look outside I will see perfect that the coin is just staying there. But then what happens is that suppose something happens okay and uh, this uh, initially the coin was glued but because of heat okay the glue dried up for example and the coin came off. Came off. And now if there is no friction between the coin and the table then what will we see what will I see is that okay that this coin okay uh, will have some velocity okay it, it has some velocity omega r the coin will start moving out and the coin will also start moving sideways. And then I, I will see that suddenly that what is the force acting on it there is absolutely no force acting on it okay why is the coin suddenly moving out and it is moving sideways. If you analyze this problem perfectly okay if you perfectly analyze this problem from an inertial frame of reference you will see that the moment the coin loses contact with the table whatever velocity it had okay it will just keep moving in along that direction. But from my point of view what I will see is that that the coin just keeps moving okay uh, outwards as well as sideways and then in a non inertial frame of reference I am suddenly at loss that there is no force acting on it why is the coin moving and then I say that that particular force acting on it okay outwards force I call that as a centrifugal force okay and this force which acts sideways I call it as the Coriolis force. But strictly speaking okay if you do everything from an inertial point of frame point of view then these kind of components okay they will automatically be taken care of okay in the in the acceleration terms for example there will be a term which goes as theta dot square r okay that I will interpret that as a centrifugal centripetal force okay. But the centrifugal force is purely coming because of the non inertial rotating frame of reference and what is that frame of reference is the frame which I am in okay I am on that rotating table and I see what is happening to the to the coin. So from my frame of reference I will suddenly see array something is happening to the coin but no force then what is that force that force is nothing I call that as a centrifugal force for the, the radially outward movement and for the sideways movement I call that as the Coriolis force. So these are the forces that only arise when we look into non uh, into rotating non inertial frames of references these forces can be interpreted when we also write down equations of motion okay from a inertial frame of reference okay but strictly speaking these names okay only make sense when we are referring to non inertial rotating frame of reference. So I hope that this clarifies this okay. So we will now take a brief tea break.